I don't know what that means because if we see a conflict before we have invested, we will just run faster than Usain Bolt can yeah. do his 100 meters yeah. and uh, take the train to wherever is first away from that founding team. Yeah, but then again, I also cannot avoid saying that sometimes we are not the best mediators and therapists yeah. because we are not independent, right? We have an interest in this. Yeah. So it's impossible not to have conflicts. But when the conflicts become unhealthy, when the team doesn't have the depth in the relationship to actually talk about the conflict, if there are deep, deep, deep underlying issues like... Welcome back to Understanding VC. I'm your host Rahul. Understanding VC is a perpetual MBA on a single subject, venture capital. And today I'll be having an in-depth conversation on founder conflicts and how founding teams can navigate them with Will Klipkin. Will is a managing partner at Cocoon Capital, an early stage VC firm based in Singapore, investing in B2B and deep tech startups across Southeast Asia. Now let's talk to him. Hey Will, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for inviting. It's always a pleasure. So I was reading a research uh, by Startup Genome Project. Um, it says that the number one reason why a startup fail is because of founder conflicts, attributing to like 65% of uh, startup failures. So would you agree? And uh, how true is that, especially in Southeast Asia? That's the first time I hear that number, but... and. I have to say it, it does resonate because, you know, at the stage of an early stage startup, the founders are basically the most important resource. In Southeast Asia, or at least in Cocoon's portfolio, right, we haven't really seen founder conflicts as being the biggest reason for failure. Uh, but this definitely, it does definitely happen. I, I would say that sometimes there is too little conflict as well. Uh, I would probably say that there are just as many companies that fail because founders are not clashing enough. Uh, so what I, I, I try to say is that there are sometimes good conflict and there's bad conflict. But but yeah, that, that's an extreme number. Um, I think especially, I think in environments where a lot of perhaps more extreme personalities are being funded, you probably would see that conflicts can go to that level. For us in Cocoon, I think that we probably stay away from those personalities more because we have been kind of burnt in the past. So we are very careful about which founders we invest in. Okay. So uh, again, curious, what is the number one reason your, the startups fail that you've seen? Lack of being able to reach product market fit. Yeah. Yeah. Within a certain time. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned that you stay away from personalities, uh, strong personalities mm -hmm. who are prone for, you know, conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you define those founders or teams? I think what we have done, I think we started doing that during COVID. We, we, we tried to take a more systematic approach in analyzing founding teams. A good founding team definitely should be more than one person. That's why we call it a team, perhaps two or three. And I think it's important for us to see that there is a kind of symbiotic, good energy relationship within the team. So we do pro that. We spend a lot of time with the founding teams. We kind of try to be super sensitive to anything that indicates that this is not a healthy relationship in the team. Um, it's like a marriage, right? In a way yeah. uh, with three people or more, sometimes two people. And you have to have some level of difference in personality. That's fine. It could be a combination of introvert and extrovert founders, for example, which is very healthy. People that tend to build are usually more introverted. People that tend to sell, want to sell and or market a company, tend to be more extroverted. So that's healthy. But it cannot be to that level where that relationship basically results in poor communication or in two extreme differences in time in terms of ownership of the company, for example. Yeah. Or um, if there's a lack of respect 
So, so basically, founder team relationship is like any other relationship, right? Ships that they have to be healthy. Yeah. Although people inside might not always agree with each other, and people might be very different, but there has to be a mutual respect. Yeah, you also mentioned about uh, good conflicts and mm -hmm. bad conflicts. Mm -hmm. So, how would you define a good conflict? So, so as I said, the major reason why companies fail for us is that they fail to do something or deliver something that the market want to pay for or want to pay sufficiently for, sufficiently fast. And to reach that level, you have to, yes, you have to ask the market, but then you also have to interpret what the market tells you. To really reach that understanding, you sometimes need a team with different views and different ways of seeing that research or with an ability to then adapt to that when you decide that this is where you want to go for a while. So it really requires people to be contributing and being listened to and to get the healthy engagement uh, yeah. where everyone is kind of working towards the same goal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like if you have two founders who think alike, then what is the point of the, yeah. the other person? Exactly. So, so that would be a company we, we probably wouldn't invest in if people are too similar. Yeah. And therefore, again, as I said, leads to failure. Yeah. Easily. Mm. Yeah. So you've been an investor for a long time now. Uh, what are the kind of conflicts most frequent that you sort of encountered? Yeah. I think the biggest conflict stems from large differences in personalities and or cultures. If you both have a big difference in personality and culture, the, the chance of achieving a state where communication is very bad or where there is not mutual respect is very high. So if you are in that kind of team, right, a small conflict can escalate very fast. Yeah. Especially if you have founders with personality disorders, more or less defined, for example, we tend to see that, for example, narcissistic founders yeah. tend to take, for example, the CEO position in the team. Uh, we do know that a lot of CEOs are narcissists or even psychopaths sometimes. But even narcissism, which is a soft way of being a psychopath or a sociopath, tend to create a very unhealthy team environment, right? So they tend to look out for themselves more than the team. If something good happens, it's their achievement. If something bad happens, it's someone else's. As a co-founder, you won't take that for too long, right? So another thing is that if you have an unhealthy state of mind like that, for example, if you're a CEO, you tend to take decisions yourself. You do not listen or you don't care about the opinions of the, the remaining team members. And that's usually a very bad idea. But this personality disorder, mm. the another thing that research says is that mm. a lot of founders have uh, these sort of neurodivergent issues. Sure. I right. mean, there's a reason why why I became a founder. I didn't yeah. really enjoy working in a big company, right? And there there are reasons why people become founders that might not necessarily lead them to be great team players or amazing at leading a company with 500 people and that's a whole other topic we can talk about, right? But yeah, usually founders are quite healthy. They're just not happy with the kind of status quo or they just want to kind of change the world a bit faster and what you can do within a big corp corporate. So I, would, I wouldn't say it's a normal thing to have what we can classify as a personality disorder, but it does happen. And that's definitely a source of conflict. Yeah. And the, I, I think the cultural thing is very important because a, l a lot of times problem happen because you if you know what where the other person is coming from, mm. and that's easier if you've known the person for a long time or you're from the same culture yep. where the behaviors are like yep. all of sort of. Yeah. So yeah, that that I really think plays a big part. <laughs> I think uh, you know the 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 one thing that uh, Ray Dalio has at Bridgewater Associates is that they have these baseball cards for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. And people write like, um, "This is how I work. This is how I like to do these. Mm -hmm. These are things that I don't like." Mm -hmm. That's 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 a great way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you mentioned about big personalities. Uh, what is that? Big personalities? Yeah. I, I think going back to, the, to, to what I said, some kind of thinking that you are so much better than the other founders. And that might happen. The, the, there are teams where the guy that, or man or woman, I say guy yeah. without gender, thinks that he or she is the best and smartest one in the room. And sometimes they are, right? And if they are so much smarter than the other co-founders, then basically this guy found the wrong co-founders. Because then there's not that mutual respect that creates a healthy climate for debate and progression towards something. I mean, in, in some cases <clears throat> that, let's say, CEO, amazing superstar founder is so smart that it doesn't matter what the, all the other founders do. And yeah, but that's rare. And it definitely doesn't lead to uh, a harmonious team and it definitely leads to conflict. Yeah. So it basically stops that person from perhaps carrying out what that person should have done had he or she been a bit better at, you know, navigating this in a nice way with the rest of the team. And usually conflicts tend to happen more during early stages? I think the pressure is on, right, in, in the early stage where you're trying to find out what you're going to create. So it's not so much, much about when, when should we launch this product or what should we do, which country should we go to after this. It's basically what the hell should we do to actually make something that anyone would pay for, right? So it's like, so it's a make or break stage of the company. So conflicts tend to, to be more severe and everything is at stake. It's yeah. not, it's not the next year's numbers going to be to your 10 million revenue is going to be, will this company ever survive? Right? Yeah. Well, what okay. are some of the, the other reasons, especially for conflicts besides big personality, you know, what else did we talk about? Narcissistic founder, people with disorders. Right. <clears throat> I, I think there's always going to be conflict, right? So one, one thing would be perhaps one team member is underperforming or is withdrawing from the team, stops coming to work, not doing what, what they said they could do because they basically can't do it. Okay. Creates a lot of unhappiness. There could be different kind of basic motivations for doing the startup. Again, you know, when there's a difference in culture or, or backgrounds, personalities, a lot of these things, like a motivation for why am I doing this, won't, perhaps they never discuss that because they only discuss the product and what they were going to do. So um, some people want to get rich very fast. Some people are very passionate about this product. They want to kind of build it no matter what. Even mm -hmm. if they run out of cash, they'll still try to do it. So if those motivations are too severe, that definitely leads to conflict. So what really makes this so serious, it could also be, it could be the strategy going forward for the company. But what makes this like a serious conflict is that they have not agreed on how to resolve conflict. But I think one of the biggest ways to get out of this is to have a mechanism for resolving conflict. Yeah. I think a um, person not pulling weight and maybe losing motivation, mm. these are clearly something that I think I've seen and also experienced. S sometimes it could it could also be because, you know, the motivation just goes away because when thing, it's high pressure, right? And then sometimes mm. uh, you end up going in a direction where which is completely different from where you've started mm -hmm. and why you decided to start. Mm -hmm. That can always happen. <laughs> yeah. So how does this uh, affect, I think, I think this just kills the company. Is there any, any other way to put this? Just to add another thing. Yeah. I mean, to do, to do a startup has so much risk involved, right? Yeah. Not everyone has the ability to take risk in their lives. Yeah. It can come from how they were brought up, how wealthy or not wealthy their families were, um, what they have experienced before, um, financial responsibilities they have, for example. So when it becomes, when you come into a state where the company might or might not survive or you have to cut your salary or perhaps there's no cash left for your salary, the stage as at where at at which the founder then kind of basically says, "I'm I'm out. I can't do this anymore. I can't take this anymore." 
that would be very different among the founders, right? Yeah. And that can also, that, that of course leads, leads to a lot of conflict. But sorry, you asked me something else. Yeah. I mean, I, I also wanted to get into this, which I, I think is important, the life stage and also the risk appetite mm. Mm. Of, of a person. Mm. And would you say, you know, the background and the childhood as of the person has, has a lot to do with this? That matters for a lot of things in life, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's, that's what, what I've observed. Says. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing that I was asking is like, how does this affect the startup? I guess it just kills. No, oh, it, it basically kills the startup because there are so many other things to do, right? Yeah. Than to fight your co-founder or to be unhappy. There is 100,000 other things to do. Yeah, this yeah. is the last thing that you want. Yeah. And from a VC perspective, like, like how does this impact your investment decision? So is this before investment and after investment? Love, love to know more. And and again, yeah, we were talking about this. A study by Harvard Business Review found that startups experiencing internal conflict receive 25% less funding compared to... Hundreds. Yeah, I, I don't know what that means because if we see a conflict before we have invested, we will just run faster than Usain Bolt can yeah. do his 100 meters yeah. and uh, take the train to wherever is first away from that funding team. So, but if it happens after we invest... How it affects our investment appetite? It goes down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we can t we can talk more about what we do when we see investor uh, or yeah. founder conflict. Yeah. So what do you do? Like you've invested and then you've realized, okay, these guys are having internal conflicts. Yeah, I think um, we understand that if we cannot resolve this conflict the startup might disappear and we lose all our cash. So we tend to spend a lot of time to try to solve that conflict. So that's like an emergency in the startup. So yeah. one of the things we tend to do is to first of all, find out what's going on. Then to work with all the founders to figure out how we can solve. And then we try to together with the founder, find a solution to it. I mean, obviously the founders are driving all this. If the founders do not want to get us involved in this, there's no way for us to force us, yeah. force, uh, to force that, right? So, but most of these conflicts can be resolved. And, and going back to something that we are also probably, all, we are still trying to be better investors, right? We're not perfect investors at any time. Um, one thing that I've seen or, and we have realized lately is that, as I mentioned earlier, there should be a way where the founding team agrees to how to resolve a conflict. So we have one company. The founding team basically had this similar idea as, as some counselors say about how to have a good marriage, right? You should never go to bed with a conflict. Yeah. So they basically had this deal. If they have a conflict, they will not go sleep until they resolve the conflict. And that leads them to sit until like 5, 6 a.m. in the morning debating every topic. So I don't know how they get to sleep in those periods of time, and they probably don't, but at least they go forward, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so but, but this is probably an extreme way of doing that. But if you have a procedure for how to deal with conflict, and then you can say, you know what? We disagree on that. Let's follow what we agreed. Perhaps you go to an offsite or perhaps you take 24 hours out and then you come back together. You have a way to do voting, right? For example, if it's a three founding t founder team, you say that if two vote for and one against, we go with majority, right? Yeah. And the last founder should not be unhappy about it. Yeah, I, I guess when you're an investor you can't run away from the fact that you're also sort of like a mediator and maybe sometimes a therapist yeah but then again i also cannot avoid saying that sometimes we are not the best mediators and therapists yeah. because we are not independent right we have an interest in this yeah so if it comes to a point where we want to help the funding team negotiate we have third-party mediators or experts that can come in and do it we, we are not the best people to do that. So who are those people? Are they advisors or? Like it can be advisors that we know, that we have seen 
you know, we have seen them being successful in the past. It can be different kinds of more experienced people that that have a passion for, for doing that and tend to be able to deep dive into an issue and can both understand the issue and also understand personalities and a little, little bit of psychology, right? So uh, you mentioned one of your teams who have a pact where they don't go to sleep before they resolve conflicts. Mm. What are the other ways that, you know, founding teams can do this? Like, you know, proactively sort of identify uh, the potential cause of conflict and resolve them? We, we probably haven't spent enough time on this topic. I mean, it is basically that you have a, you have a deal for how to make decisions using voting. If there, if let's say there are two founders, right? Yeah. This becomes much more complicated. Then it's like equal say. And sometimes they can agree on a third person they both trust to come in in those cases and basically leave it up to, to them. For example, someone they both respect, but that's sometimes hard to find. So, yeah, I don't have a great answer to that. I, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of founding teams explicitly agreeing on this, and that's something we should look more into. But yeah, okay. Uh, I, I guess one so, uh, solution is like the the governance structure that you put in place mm. right when you start the company, right? Yeah. But besides that, you know, are there like conflict resolution frameworks or other platforms uh, that can really help maybe some tools i mean you you have the whole system of mediation right which is a very tried and tested uh sequence there are professional mediators yeah. out there that you can hire and they are professional so that is something that you often see that in legal agreements as well between companies but it can also be used between people and between founders. You know, personally, as an investor, uh, what are some red flags that you look out for? You know, you're, you you have a brief period of mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. interacting with founders before you have to take a, make a decision. Mm -hmm. So what are those things that you look for as like a, maybe a potential source of future conflicts? Right. So we, as I, as I mentioned, right, we, we do spend a lot of time trying to understand the personalities of the founders yeah. because that means a lot to us. We tend to sometimes create situations that are a bit tense sometimes to stress people because we know that people show who they are under stress. It's very hard not to show who you are under stress because it's just a, how the brain works. Um, I guess we try to find out if this is a healthy, balanced team where there is respect. We would, so red flags would be anything that indicate, indicates that this is not the case. Let's say it seems like one person decides everything or it seems like I've been in, I've been in pitches where one founder talked down to the other founder. So th this is horrible, right? And ob obviously we, we ran away from that because that's something that, that, of course, the other founders should never accept that. As a founder, you should never accept being talked down to ever. But that's a clear red flag or a situation where, for example, where, where, where for example one founder has 100% of equity and the two other founders have been promised perhaps something in the future. Again, something that's not acceptable, yeah. right? So it just signals that something is off. There, there's a lack of fairness. There's a lack of respect. There's a lack of health. Yeah. 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 I've personally seen this. There was a startup that you invested in where the introverted builder of the st founding member, mm -hmm. builder founding member mm -hmm. had lower stake. Mm -hmm. And then you made sure that that's not the case. <laughs> that's right. So uh, could you share an example of a start startup founder conflict? that you successfully resolved. Why don't I talk about my own startup ages ago, right? When I yeah. was a dot-com founder. So my conf, my co-founder and I couldn't really agree on a few things. And what we did was that we brought in a CEO. Uh, then we brought in another CEO <laughs> after that again, <laughs> because the first didn't work out that well. The second one was brought in by our VC because uh, they, they they knew this guy from before. So so that's sometimes a way of resolving it, right? Either 
getting yet another co-founder in or perhaps having someone else to to run the show. I mean, I didn't have any experience running a company with 50 people. I could barely run a company with five people. And I was I was like 28. I had no idea what I was doing. So so that's one way of doing that because then a lot of pressure is off, right? And then we as founders could now focus on what we were good at. And the major decisions had to be made also, including this third guy who basically was the, was the one running the show. So that's one way of doing it. Yeah. Mm. What are some of the other lessons that you learned during the process of doing this? Because, you know, founders usually also have egos. And oh, big yeah. That, right? Oh, I'm, I don't know <laughs> how much I want to say about that. It, it was obviously very difficult because it's like having another parent coming in and starting to be the main parent for your baby, which I don't know how you would do that. In, in, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it was very, very difficult. And, and of course, the new, the new CEO that came in wouldn't have the same stake in the business. And that also always leads to conflicts. I mean, so, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the perfect solution, right? I mean, and no solution is ever perfect. You, you just want, at least, you want to do the best for the company. Probably this wasn't the best for me, perhaps as a, as personally, but it was definitely the best for the company. Yeah. And that's not a thing that's important when there are conflicts, right? It often comes from a lack of thinking and putting the company first and, and not yourself first. Yeah, this is something that I've recently increasingly realized that if you make decisions in the best interest comp in the best interest of the company, it's easier mm. to make decisions. Yeah. And it's also the, the best way for everybody. Yeah. And it takes away the, the ego, right? Out yeah. of a decision, for example. Yeah. Which is the biggest obstacle sometimes to yeah. a good outcome. Yeah. On the flip side, yeah. Um, uh, could you also share an example of how you could not maybe share a, a conflict, founder conflict? We, we had a, a funny thing. We, we had uh, two founders that came to us where the guy that was building the whole thing had a very low ownership stake. Yeah. And during that process where we met him, he was vocal about wanting to have a more equal part of the business. The main founder had the idea, but didn't really work full time in the business, which is not a red flag if you're a founder, right? So that founder couldn't really define how much he worked in the business, but he said, he said, well, why don't you sit down and you find out how much each of us should own before you invest in us? And I thought, foolishly enough, that this was a great idea. You know, investors are very happy to be asked to help because, you know, that means we can, you know, do something useful. So I did analyze that. We came back. I suggested that this guy should have a bigger ownership stake. But the other founder, I think, didn't agree to that. And basically, during that meeting with us, the founder with the lower stake basically said, you know what, I'm done with this. I launched my own startup. And by the way, you don't have the rights to the code I developed because you didn't sign a an IP agreement with me because I actually don't have an employment agreement. And we were like, just, I mean, I, I wasn't in that exact meeting, but my co-founder and Michael, Michael was there. Both of these founders then pitched each of their companies in the same meeting. And they both asked if we wanted to invest in them. Yeah. Of course, we, 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 we ran away again, faster than the world record. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing was that the idea is really good. Yeah. So usually. So, so I, uh, yeah. But I wouldn't say that company failed because I think they both proceeded to launch their companies and they're actually doing quite well. But that company that they were planning to start here, kind of in, in the context of those two working together, of course, that broke up. And um, do you think companies will inevitably fail when this happens or, you know, it leads to problems, but it can be fixed? I think it's, it's natural to have conflict. Yeah. And if you use that to the advantage of the company, it, it usually can lead to the company improving. Yeah. And 
to have better decisions being made. It's impossible not to have conflicts. But when it when when the conflicts become unhealthy, when the team doesn't have the depth in their relationship to actually constructively talk about the conflict, if there are deep, deep, deep underlying issues like personality disorders or absence of respect, then it's very hard to see the company succeed. And you mentioned that it's also healthy and definitely this leads to better decision making because you have varied perspective mm-hmm. and better strategy, uh, especially at early stage. You don't have an option of trying a, lo- a lot of things. You're strapped for time as well as resources. So mm-hmm. this should really help. But besides that, is there anything else that uh, good conflicts sort of are good for the startup? Yeah. I mean, sometimes a startup can navigate its way to find what I talked about in terms of product market fit. Sometimes the company is actually doing something that is never going to work. So it does require the company to do something quite different or completely different or significantly different. So we call that a pivot, right? And to do a pivot is really, really, really hard. And a lot of founders sometimes have an ego or they feel they have committed to one strategy because they have talked about it or they would feel it as a failure if they have to change because that means they were wrong in the first place. So you have something in your personality where you cannot admit to being wrong, for example. That's very unhealthy. And that can lead to conflict, right? And then sometimes perhaps because of this conflict, the majority of the other founders or by talking to your co-founder, if you're two people, you might actually resolve that conflict by actually doing that pivot or basically forcing the non-willing founder to actually accept reality. Because startups are all about accepting reality. I think there are more So if you talk about conflict as a root of failure, I've seen more companies fail because of a lack of accepting reality. Yeah. That's more than 60, or if you say 65% of conflicts uh, or or companies fail because of that, I would say 65% perhaps fail because of lack of reality acceptance. Yeah, it's so true. I've been, you know, guilty of that. I think uh, Jeff Bezos calls this seeking the truth. Uh, Yeah, as an investor... Are there any other ways that you actively support? To avoid or resolve, Uh, you mean? To resolve. So I I think the most important thing we can do is to do preventive measures that avoid a future conflict. So, So one thing we have done, started during COVID, is to use personality assessment tools that tries to uncover key motivations behind what you do. So we use a tool called Fingerprint for Success, Australian startup. And they do not focus that much on evaluating people, but more about on how they work together and how the team functions. So there's a, there's a, there's a one function inside that tool where you can look at individuals, but you can also look at them as a group. And then you can look at potential conflicts, potential, you know, synergies within that group based on the individual profiles. And that's quite, quite interesting. So it, it goes to describe how you motivate people, how you convince people, what is important for people. And that can be so different. I mean, I, I discover things about myself and my co-founder in, in Cocoon that they were, they were quite astonishing, for example, when we that, uh, did that internally. And, and what we do is that, and I don't want to talk about that now, but what we do when we, when we, when we consider an investment then is that we put ourselves, so we put the, the lead partner and the lead associates, associate into that group of founders, right? Because we're going to form some kind of external team, right? If you're going to work together. And then we see how our personalities will gel with the personalities of the team and we create this cocoon company team. And that's also quite useful. Yeah. And especially because it sometimes teaches the individual founders something they didn't know about themselves as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I think not just for the founders and also to have, you know, what the team would look like and what would be the sort of personalities when the team from Cocoon potentially joins mm -hmm. uh, the team. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um, are there any other tools? Do you think, you know, uh, maybe an AI tool can <laughs> um, yeah, potentially detect all this <laughs> before it becomes a major issue and potentially solve? I have seen a tool that detects people not telling the truth by analyzing eye movements and voice and so on, right? Yeah. I haven't seen tools that discover more deep issues, but I'm sure that that might come, right? Because anything a, a human can do, an AI can do better, uh, presumably, right? So in terms of analyzing and meeting with the founders, I'm sure that the AI can pick up things I would miss. Yeah. But I haven't, I haven't seen a tool like that at all. No. It could be a future idea for a, for a startup. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yeah. is there anything else, you know, the broader startup ecosystem can do to help educate and even help founders uh, when there are conflicts? Yeah. <laughs> Before you answer, <laughs> this one, listening to this podcast will <laughs> might really help. But yeah, besides that. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So one thing I think is improving general mental health and to develop a deeper understanding of yourself and how to improve yourself, I think, when you work with other people. So it comes first with understanding who you are, right? And then understanding who you want to be and then doing something about it. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing would be to find efficient, healthy, constructive ways to deal with conflict when it happens. So basically, as you said before, right, uh, work on governance in the team. So you kind of pre prepare for, for conflict before it happens. So there's... There is not a stigma about disagreeing because it can lead to a lot of difficult things. And, uh, you know, if you are two founders, perhaps, yes, perhaps you have a deal with a mediator or already before anything happened because you just want to protect the company. Yeah. Hmm. And investors, perhaps investors could be better at even asking for that to be in place as part of their due diligence or their list of requirements for a startup before they invest. Anything that you find different when compared to maybe Europe or US and Southeast Asia? Mm -hmm. That is either, you know, adding to the problem or... <laughs> yeah, Asia is such a big place with so many different cultures. I, I tend to think that mental health or talking openly about emotions is less accepted in Asia than in Europe and the US perhaps, and that can lead to issues, but hard to say anything else. So one suggestion again would be like, you no, know, pick who you want to work with very carefully, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people do that really well. Yeah, uh, but that's but, a very good point. That, that's, 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 that's preparation number one. Yeah. It's already so hard to find a co-founder. Yeah. And now it became even harder. Yeah. 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 This was great. Well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. My pleasure. It's not an easy topic.